great. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, and, and thank you for joining us for this uh, informal virtual meet and greet. I'm Dave Kareen. I'm the uh, chair of the undergraduate program in cognitive science. Um, and I, I'd like to just welcome all of you here, uh, especially under these, these, uh, these circumstances. Um, as you know, the Cognitive Science Program is a very popular program at UC Davis. It continues to grow in, and to be popular. Um, and um, I, again, I really it, it, it owes to you guys who have such great perseverance under the circumstances that we are still thriving the way we are. Today, I just wanted to um, uh, just take this time to introduce a couple of the, the people behind the scenes, uh, some of whom you might have met before, others who you may not know. Um, so I, I, I want to do that. Um, and um, I, I have my, oh, sorry, I have to find my notes. <laughs> I, have to, I actually wrote this out. Good. Great, great. So, um, so as I said, I, I'm the chair of the, 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 of the undergraduate program committee. I'm a professor in linguistics. I have an appointment in psychology as well. And I work at the Center for Mind and Brain. And my own interest is very multidisciplinary. I'm interested in language processing, especially in children with uh, deafness. Um, so I'm interested in both spoken and signed languages as well as um, uh, assistive therapies that are being used uh, in these populations. Um, let me introduce a couple of the program committee members. So the Cognitive Science Program has behind it um, a, a program committee that, um, again, we kind of lurk in the, behind, in the behind the scenes to try to make sure that the program is running uh, efficiently, that we can get enough classes and get people on board and get people through uh, on the, the expected time frame. Um, and so I, I'd first like to just introduce Zoe Drayson, who many of you may know because I know she teaches the intro class. Zoe, do you want to say a couple words? You're welcome to. Oh, you're muted. Oh, okay. I'm unmuting that. This is, yeah, a year I've been doing this and I still can't unmute myself. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I, some of you, absolutely, I recognize from having um, taught you in the intro to cognitive science class. I'm based in the philosophy department. Um, I am uh, really glad this was organized for this evening because it meant that I could take a break from working on uh, paper that I'm writing, which is about the ontological status of algorithms. So it's about, it's where philosophy meets computer science. It's mm. basically, are algorithms ag abstract entities or concrete entities? Um, so yeah, and it was starting to make my brain hurt. Um, so <laughs> that's the kind of thing that I do. Come and talk to me if you're interested in that. Fascinating. Fantastic. Uh, Kenji Sege is a professor in linguistics, and uh, I'll have him say a couple words as well. Hey, everybody. Yes, uh, I'm Kenji. I'm in linguistics, and uh, I usually teach the computational linguistics course, Linguistics 177, and the text processing course, Linguistics 127. So maybe I will see you in my course one of these days. Thanks, Kenji. And let me just tell you about some of the other program committee members who, who aren't here this evening. Uh, we have Norm Matloff, who's a, a professor in the computer science and engineering program. Uh, John Henderson, who's a, a professor in psychology, works on perception. Uh, Jakin Dietrich, who's in the Department of Neurobiology, Physiology and Behavior. Uh, Steve Locke, who's in the Department of Psychology, but on sabbatical this year. Um, and last but not least, uh, Richard Husky, who you're going to be hearing from uh, shortly. Um, and uh, so we, we have this, this, this great uh, little kind of program committee that's well representing a lot of the programs or departments that are uh, providing uh, coursework for, for you guys for your major. So it, it helps us try to be responsive to the changes that are happening in the various departments. So that's all going on behind the scenes. Um, and the other, the other kind of um, leg of our, our uh, administrative uh, uh, mission is it's held up by the uh, excellent advising staff, many of whom are here today. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Melina uh, and ask her to introduce herself and, her, and some of her staff who are really try, are providing great guidance and also uh, overseeing some of these kind of bottlenecks that sometimes uh, happen uh, within the program. Hi, everybody. My name is Melina Gillies Doherty. I'm the undergraduate programs manager for cognitive science as well as for psychology 
philosophy and science and te technology studies. So I have the pleasure of getting uh, to coordinate the advising services um, for each of those majors. And we have a fabulous team, uh, most of whom is here tonight, who will uh, be introducing themselves shortly. Um, I just wanted to say a few things first, uh, which is that we, um, our advising team is made up of five or six professional staff members and a team of 10 fabulous peer advisors. Um, if you're interested in becoming a peer advisor at some point, like if you are one of those folks who just loves making academic plans for yourself and for friends, or you just think cognitive science is super great, we will be hiring new um, peer advisors for next year um, pretty soon. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and then we offer uh, a variety of appointments and now drop in advising too. We just um, hired a new advisor, 50% uh, who's doing pretty much nothing but drop in advising, which is great because I know our appointment calendar has been really hard to um, to get an appointment with us. So our drop in advising, I just want to make sure you all are aware that's happening. And it's usually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday afternoons, and Thursday and Friday mornings. And we'll drop the link to that in the chat. Um, and of course, there's always email. Um, we'll include that in the chat as well. Uh, so we're going to introduce each of the advisors because I know some of you haven't met us in person before, um, you know, especially if you're a new student. So we wanted to introduce ourselves and just tell you um, who we are, where we're from, and then uh, I think we decided on sharing our favorite podcast or book or movie or TV series. Um, so I will start. My hometown is Redding, California, uh, which is north of Davis a few hours um, before you get to Mount Shasta, you get to Reading. And my favorite podcast currently is a podcast called 20,000 Hertz. They uh, reveal the stories behind the world's most recognizable and interesting sounds. And I am a musician and a huge sound nerd, so it's really fun uh, to learn. And it's the best way to be learning about sounds uh, by listening to a podcast. Uh, can't get that by reading a book about it. So well, that's me. And next we will go to Alyssa. Hey everyone, my name is Alyssa Magorian and I'm an undergraduate advisor um, in the Yellow Cluster supporting cognitive science, philosophy, science and technologies and philosophy. Um, and let's see, I grew up in a small town called Patterson, which is in the Central Valley, um, kind of near Modesto, Turlock area, um, also known as the armpit of California. <laughs> um, I, I really enjoyed growing up in that um, small town setting, um, but I do uh, really appreciate living in Sacramento now, um, having, um, having to be closer to to many more amenities and access to, um, you know, Tahoe and the Bay Area much closer. So it's it's nice. Um, I let's see. My partner and I have been starting to watch The Equalizer. It's a new TV show on CBS starring Queen Latifah, and that has been really fun. <laughs> Just something totally different. Um, and basically, the premise is that uh, Queen Latifah. Um, she is a uh, ex-CIA agent who is uh, advocating for victims of crimes um, or who are, are unable to go to the law for justice. And so she is a, an equalizer in terms of justice. <laughs> it's a, just a fun way to escape reality these days, that's all. <laughs> Yeah, unmute myself again. I'm Jillian. I'm another one of the advisors for all of the majors they have already said. And I'm from Anaheim, California, home of Disneyland. And my favorite podcast is Reply All, which is a podcast about the internet. Hello, everyone. I'm Rachel Hale. I'm originally from Vallejo, California. Oh, and I'm another advisor in the department. So yes, I'm originally from the North Bay um and my husband and I have been watching Killing Eve lately we've been kind of binging it and we're on season three now and it is fabulous so I highly recommend it hey everybody I'm Stacy Jenkins 
and I am also one of the advisors. I'm from Lodi, which is a smaller town between Sacramento and Stockton. And um, I am just now starting to watch a new Netflix show called My Hollow Love, um, hollow like hologram. And it's a Korean drama that is a, about this woman who uh, starts a relationship with her AI hologram. Um, and so we discover that the, uh, the AI developer modeled the hologram after himself. So there's like a real person behind the hologram. So if anyone is looking for inspiration of things to watch or podcasts to listen to, hopefully this gives you a few ideas. Um, I see Zoe has contributed an idea as well uh, in the chat. Feel free to add <laughs> your own. Uh, anyways, we are really excited to get to virtually meet you like this and um, encourage you uh, if you have any questions about, you know, what classes should you be taking for cognitive science, um, wanting to make a plan for classes to take next year, uh, you know, reach out to us. Um, again, I said, I, I know I said already that we recognize that appointments have been limited, but if you keep trying, um, new appointments open up most nights around midnight. Um, and then there's always the drop in advising now. And then of course, email. So we look forward to getting to meet you. All right, back to you, Dave. Great, thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Um, I wish I had time to watch or listen to podcasts, you know, but when I do, the, I love The Crown. I see Stacy is also a Crown fan. Um, that, that's a great, a great program. Um, anyway, without further ado, oh, there's one more thing I wanna say is that um, you may, may or may not know that there is a, a, an associated cognitive science club uh, that's on campus. Um, and Jeanette Mann has, has been kind of the presiding president of that. Um, I'm not exactly sure how active it's been this quarter. And again, we're hoping that as things start to get back to normal, that we'll see uh, an uptick in participation in that. But that's another way to uh, meet other fellow cognitive science scientists like yourselves uh, and get some word on like what are good classes, what are classes to avoid and so forth. Um, so that, that's always a, a good opportunity. Um, and um, I think what I'll do now is I'll introduce our get our speaker for today. Um, let me go to back to my notes, make sure I have everything uh, right here, right. Um, so um, we're really very happy to have uh, Richard Husky uh, uh, join us um, here tonight. Um, Richard received his uh, MA and PhD in communications with an emphasis in cognitive science from uh, UC Santa Barbara. What a great place to go to school. Uh, his undergraduate degree was in business administration, which just shows that a cognitive science major can, can be made from almost any background. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting angle um, that he's gotten into cognitive science from business administration. Uh, uh, Richard joined the faculty here at UC Davis in communications in, in 2019. Uh, and this year we were able to bring him aboard um, on the program committee uh, for the cognitive science major. And so we're thrilled to have his, his youth and his input um, as we, as we uh, steer this, this, this ship. Um, and uh, so Dr. Husky is a principal investigator in the Cognitive Communications Science Laboratory, an affiliated member at the Center for Mind and Brain. And he is vice chair of the International Communication Association's Communication Science and Biology Interest Group. Um, his studies show how uh, motivation influences the attitudes people hold and the behaviors they adopt. And he makes use of a variety of techniques in this endeavor and is really one of the uh, real innovator in this emerging field that bridges communication science um, and a uh, communication uh, and, and cognition um, in, under the rubric of cognitive science. So we're really thrilled to have him uh, share a talk with us uh, titled, What Video Games Can Tell Us About the Brain? So I'll turn it over uh, to Richard. All right, well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it and happy to be here this evening. Um, let's see, let's, I guess, share my screen to start. It's always the most underwhelming part of the whole thing. And now I ask the obligatory question, can you all see my screen? Excellent. One day I'll be brave enough to just dive right into screen sharing without asking, but I, I'm not, a year later, I'm not there yet. So um, let's see, yeah, this is my, 
second year at UC Davis. It's a little weird to have spent more time under a quarantine and away from campus than actually on campus. So I'm very much like all of you, I'm sure looking forward to getting back into the swing of things. But, you know, quarantine's been nice. You know, people were asking what shows they've been watching. I've done what every other person it seems like during quarantine's done. I started watching Schitt's Creek. I've joined TikTok. Uh, I bake bread. You know, I, I'm just a complete follower apparently. And so that's, that's been how my quarantine's been going uh, so far. But anyway, diving into things, I wanna talk to you about uh, some work that we're doing in the lab using naturalistic stimuli to try to understand these cognitive science questions that we have. And one of the favorite stimuli that we tend to use are video games. We like to use them and it turns out that participants have a fun time uh, doing our studies as well. So it's kind of a, a nice win-win for everybody. So I'm sure that you've probably seen this figure somewhere before, at least in one year classes, it might be uh, burned into your brain. And so I'm not going to um, dive too deeply into it, but these are the fields that are supposed to uh, bring together this idea of uh, cognitive science. It's maybe not quite so simple because First off, it's missing my field um, where, I, where I kind of belong in here. Uh, I'm, I'm in the Department of Communication. My research, like many of the people that you've already heard from tonight is pretty multidisciplinary. So I borrow theories and methods both from psychology as well as cognitive neuroscience to answer some of my core questions. And I think you'll see a fair amount of that this evening. So given that my uh, interests kind of blend communication, psychology, and cognitive neuroscience, I'm kind of lumped into this group of people that have this overarching question, which is how does the brain enable the mind? And uh, whoever figures that out is going to win multiple Nobel Prizes. Uh, I'm certainly not going to, and tonight's talk is not going to present an answer to this giant question. Um, but this is kind of like if we're narrowing down into you know, where I fit in this scheme of things. This is kind of where my territory starts to lie and where I start to feel really comfortable. Uh, slightly smaller question, but still really big question is how the brain does something called engaging or enabling cognitive control. It's basically, if we're gonna talk about what cognitive control is, it's how people pursue these very goal-directed motivationally relevant behaviors. And I actually like this quote very much from Miller and Cohen in their 2001 article where they introduced the idea of what cognitive control is. And they situated, it's not quite as big as how does the brain enable the mind, but it's still a pretty big question. One of the great mysteries of the brain is cognitive control. How can interactions between millions of neurons result in behavior that is coordinated and appears willful and voluntary? And so this is a, a big long running question. I mean, you can see the original citation for this paper is 2001. Uh, this is kind of the paper that launched a thousand ships of people investigating uh, cognitive control. And 20 years later, there's still a lot that we don't know. And so my lab is kind of trying to help chip away at this problem just a little bit. And so if for people that typically study cognitive control, the way they tend to look at it are through these really high experimental control laboratory-based experiments. So if you're a participant, you get you come into the lab, you sit down to computer screen, and you might do something that's called a Stroop task. And what you'll do is you'll see words appear on the screen. Sometimes the words are uh, congruent with the color. So you know, here we see the word green, and the color for the word green is also in green. Hey, that's pretty easy. Your job here is to say something like, okay, well, what color is either the word saying or what color is the text, right? You might get something that's a neutral trial where you have a coloration of the text, but the word itself is not a color. And then you get something that would be like an incongruent trial, right? Where you see uh, red colored text and then green colored words. And even I had to pause and slow down to make sure I didn't screw that up because I'm seeing green really, really strongly here, even though you know, I, my job might be to respond what color is the text itself, not what's it saying, right? And so people would argue or make the argument that tasks like these or the flanker task and so on require us to deploy cognitive control. They require us to override some prepotent response that we have 
you know, the desire to say the word is, or the color is green, even though the text isn't red, and overwrite that prepotent response with some goal that we have in memory, right? We need to respond with what the actual color of the text is, not what the words say, right? And so one of the core findings that we see over and over and over, uh, there's been thousands of Stroop test studies and the results replicate pretty nicely. Uh, one of the things that we see is for congruent trials, errors tend to be quite low pe and people respond pretty quickly and accurately, right? So if I ask you to say what, you know, uh, what color is uh, the, the text in the congruent trial, you're gonna be really fast and accurate when you tell me it's green, right? Uh, by the comparison, we see lots of errors. We see really slow responses in incongruent trials. People have to slow down and kind of remember what their goal was and override that prepotent response, right? And this is a pattern that we see over and over. If we get people out of just the regular lab and then put them into an fMRI scanner and scan their brains while they do these sort of trials, we again see a pretty consistent and distributed pattern of results in brain regions that are implicated in what has kind of started to become known as the frontal parietal control network or a series of brain structures that are implicated in deploying cognitive control, right? And so these two figures here come from a nice uh, review paper that kind of outline what it is that we're talking about here. And so the trick is, if that's, that's how we study cognitive control in the lab, but what we really want to get to is some situation where we can understand how people actually deploy cognitive control in their everyday life, right? I mean, I don't know the last time you were somewhere out going about your business and were like, oh, good, I need, I have this great opportunity to do a Stroop task. Like, that's not what's happening in our everyday lives, right? Uh, what happens in our everyday lives is actually much more uh, complicated, much more distal. The goals that we have to keep in mind are much longer term. They might not necessarily be as obvious or have as clear of outcomes for how we get there, right? And so one of the things that I think uh, sets this up really nicely is uh, this quote from Botnick and Graver, where they kind of outline what it is that we really want to get to when we're talking about cognitive control. And they write, picture an undergraduate student sitting in the library with the intention of studying for an exam. Sometimes she finds it's going well. She's able to attend closely to the material and to devise and execute effective strategies for retaining it. At other junctures, she struggles to concentrate, feeling drawn to her email or social network accounts. Sometimes she yields to these impulses, feeling she really does need a rest. At other times, she replies herself, compelled by the thought that if she doesn't, the exam might not go so well, undermining her hopes of gaining admission to a prestigious medical school. Right, and so like when we're thinking about what we really want to do with the study of cognitive control, we want to study things that look a little bit more like this, right? But that's not really what's happening when we bring people into the laboratory and have them do a strip task or a flanker task. And so there's this really big gap. Now, admittedly, it would be really hard to do an experiment where we watch somebody for, um, you know, several years as they applied to medical school and then we systematically, you know, manipulated everything we needed to manipulate to have all the experimental control and precision that we needed, but maybe we can find some happy middle ground, something that's a little more naturalistic and real world than these low, you know, high control, but maybe not so generalizable tasks that we do in the lab and something that looks a little bit more like this problem of the woman at the library. And so, in my lab, the way we try to find this happy middle ground is through using video games. And so one of, uh, you know, we've used a bunch of different types of video games in the lab, but one of the things that we've kind of been working on over the years is actually developing and validating this silly little video game that we call Asteroid Impact. Um, Asteroid Impact is uh, really simple for people to use. Uh, I actually made it when I was a grad student at UCSB. And the reason we made it so simple was because we were trying all these complicated video games. Uh, this is what you don't read in any of the published papers, by the way. Um, we were trying these complicated papers and, or video games and like nobody could figure them out because they were 
not playing video games that we're all spending too much time at the beach and having way more fun than playing video games. So like I couldn't get undergrads to come in the lab and learn things quickly. And so I needed something that everyone could be good at pretty fast. And so in this game, basically your mouse turns into this little spaceship, you drag it around trying to avoid the asteroids and collect these little crystal targets, right? And what we can do in this video game, since we created it, is we can specify everything that we want to happen in the game. We can say how many asteroids there need to be, how quickly they move around the game screen, how many targets you need to collect, uh, and so on. And we can specify all of this in advance, program it into a nice little experiment, and it actually records what's going on as well. So we can have a nice log of exactly what you did. And then the last thing we can do, if you look at this little corner here, you'll see this little red circle is we can have visual and auditory probes appear at different locations on the screen. And we can say, hey, respondent, press a button uh, as soon as you see that probe. So we can kind of measure these tasks uh, these kind of tasks that are a little bit adjacent to or not directly related to playing the video game in and of itself, right? And so uh, I'm going to talk to you about some research tonight that we've been doing with, uh, with Fast Rate Impact over the years. And so one of the first questions we might ask ourselves is, all right, if we're going to move away from these um, really uh, tightly controlled studies of cognitive control, like the Stroop cask into something a little more naturalistic, can we see some indicators that, you know, we're actually still talking about the same thing when we change the task? Do we see behavioral and neural indicators that we're having somebody engage in something that we can still call cognitive control, right? And so one of the first things we've done to look at this is we conducted a series of four experiments, three in the lab, uh, behaviorally, and then the fourth, um, where we had people go into the fMRI scanner and do this video game as well. And basically what happened is on one screen, we had them uh, play the video game. And then on the other screen, there were a bunch of little probes that appeared at various locations. And they were told, you know, okay, as you play the video game, try to do as best you can. But when you see one of these probes appear on the other screen, I want you to press a button as quickly as possible. Basically what this lets us do is it lets us measure the extent to which they are allocating attentional resources to one thing or one task or the other, right? Are they allocating a bunch of attentional resources to playing the video game? Do they have a, a sufficient attentional resources left over to observe these probes that are appearing on the other screen and respond quickly, right? And so what we can do and or what we've done in this sort of experiment is we've manipulated three conditions. We've had one condition where the difficulty of the video game is really, really low. So the asteroids are moving around super slowly. Participants can collect all the targets really easily. They're all doing perfectly, right? Nothing, nobody's dying, nobody's having a hard time. Everything's easy. The other condition we manipulate is a high difficulty condition. So the asteroids are moving around really, really rapidly. Participants are dying all the time. We've uh, had a couple break a mouse because they got frustrated and slammed it in the table. So it seems to be working pretty well. Um, and then we have one final condition, which is our balance difficulty condition. This is where we have a little algorithm in the game that dynamically adjusts the speed of the asteroids based on how well the, that participant's doing. So if the participant starts to do really well, the asteroids speed up a little bit, the game gets a little harder. If the participant starts to have a hard time, it starts dying, we slow the asteroids down a little bit. And so the idea is it's constantly balancing the difficulty of the game with the participant's ability of the game. And so we have these three conditions. If we're going to um, kind of put labels on them, you could call the, the balance difficulty condition our cognitive control condition. It's the one we're particularly interested in. You could call the low difficulty condition maybe a boredom condition and the high difficulty condition a frustration condition. Right. And so we have these four or these three experimental conditions. And if we're going to start looking uh, for so signs of cognitive control during this balance difficult condition, we're basically going to look for a couple of things. One, if you remember from the Stroop task, you already saw that when uh, things require the deployment of control, you'll tend to see longer reaction times, a little bit more error. Right. So we might expect that playing the balance difficulty condition actually requires the most level of control from our participants. And so we should expect to see longer reaction times when responding to these little probes. We should also expect um, 
to see neural responses in brain regions implicated in cognitive control processing, right? And so basically what we're kind of looking for is we're looking for this nice inverted U-shaped pattern. And I'm gonna point that out because you'll see across the data I'm gonna show you today or tonight, uh, this inverted U-shaped pattern quite a bit, okay? And so that's generally what it is that we're looking for. And so what do we see? Well, again, there's four studies here and uh, these are the, the data for them. So the plot on the left is basically just a self-reported reward component. One of the things we would expect is the balanced difficulty condition should be the most rewarding condition for people to be in. And that's across three studies. What we see, uh, you're looking at this middle column here. This is the, these are the three studies uh, results. And we see that over and all, overall across all three studies, people do say this balanced difficulty condition is most rewarding. Now, crucially, if we go to this plot on the right, we'll start to look at the reaction time trials, right? How, how long it takes people on average to respond to those little probes that appear. And again, we see this nice inverted U-shaped pattern across all four studies. People tend to be slowest to respond to those probes um, when they're in this balanced difficulty or cognitive control condition. They're allocating most of their control resources to playing the video game. And as a result, they're slower to respond to probes that appear uh, you know, that are kind of tangential to playing the video game. So that's some good, a good start for us, right? If we look at the neuroimaging results, we actually see again, some pretty promising and compelling findings. So we had participants go into the scanner, play this game again. And basically what we can do is we can uh, take the brain activation that participants are, the brain activity that participants are having in all three of these conditions and, can, and do a statistical comparison uh, between conditions, right? So basically we can take the neural activity in this balanced difficulty condition, and then we can take the neural activity from the low difficulty and high difficulty conditions and basically compare the two. We can say, let's subtract the neural activity from the low and high difficulty conditions from this balanced difficulty condition. Anything that's left over, we can say is neural activity that should be unique to the, the balanced difficulty or cognitive control condition. And so when we do that, what we see is, uh, again, neural activity patterns in brain regions that are commonly implicated in cognitive control studies. These maps actually look really, really similar to those maps that I showed you a little bit earlier in the presentation. So again, some pretty nice validation work. You know, four studies, it's kind of showing a similar pattern of consistent results. And so it's telling us, among other things, yeah, we can use these naturalistic stimuli to induce cognitive control in a still fairly highly experimental control environment, but with a little bit more, you know, natural, making the task a little bit more naturalistic along the way. That's kind of fun. So we can, since we've demonstrated this is something that's working, right? The next thing we can do is we can ask ourselves, okay, well, can we do some additional analyses to get a better understanding of what's going on in the brain when people are deploying cognitive control in this naturalistic environment. And so one of the things that we've done is uh, we've applied network science techniques to try to understand uh, the, the way the brain is working in, in this task. And so what we do is basically we, we borrow these tools from network science, you might be most familiar seeing them, you know, as kind of social network graphs, but you can actually do the same thing with brain data. And so basically what we do is we take the brain uh, imaging data that we have, we extract the neural time series from a bunch of different little nodes in the brain. So as participants are playing the game, we record uh, neural responses across their entire brain and we can extract the time series of this neural response across all these different little nodes, right? And then we can ask, well, how well are these nodes or how are these nodes interacting with each other? How are they transmitting information? And one of the ways that we can do that is we can essentially uh, look to see how correlated any two neural time series are. And so the, the underlying logic here is that highly correlated neural time series are an indication that two or more nodes are um, potentially communicating information with one another. And so what we can do is we can build these big correlation matrices. There's 264 different nodes that we extract the neural time series for. 
we basically correlate all those neural time series with each other, right? We do this for the three experimental conditions that I told you about. We want to make sure that we don't have any noise in our data. So what we do is we tend to re uh, remove all the low correlations in this big correlation matrix. So that's the thresholding. And then we make it binary. We make it a zero or one. We basically say correlations that survived the thresholding, we recode as one. Correlations that didn't survive the thresholding, we recode as zero. That's what you see in this black and white matrix here. Anything that's a white um, square basically represents a correlation that survived the threshold. And so then we can draw our graph. If there's a one in this correlation matrix, we can basically draw the connection between those two nodes in the brain, right? And this is spatially constrained to the brain, but you know, it's, it, it, we can make the spatial, we can remove that spatial constraint and make the graph look somewhat arbitrary like we see over here in this last panel. And what we can do is we can start to apply classic network science metrics to this graph. So one of the things that network scientists like to do is they like to calculate um, something called degree, okay? And what degree is, is degree is basically the amount of nodes any given node is connected to, right? So if we look at node A here, for instance, node A has a degree of four. So we can, how do we tell? We can count the edges, right? One, two, three, four edges, right? Or we can ask what's going on with the degree for node B here. Well, node B has just one other node that it's connected to, right? So node B has a degree of one. So we could think about node A as being pretty well integrated with the network relative to node B, right? The other thing we can ask is we can ask ourselves, well, how easily does information travel between nodes in the network, right? This is a metric called global efficiency. And so let's imagine we wanted, you know, node A had information that it wanted to get to node B. Well, we would ask ourselves, how many jumps does it take across the shortest path for information to get from node A to B? And so again, we just count the edges, right? We can go one, two, three. So from getting node to node A to node B, it just takes three edges to get there, right? And so I'm telling you all this because this is, these are the two metrics that we're going to see in the next two slides. We're going to see information about degrees, so how connected different subnetworks in the brain are during these three experimental conditions, the low difficulty condition, the high difficulty condition, and the balance condition. And then we're going to see information about the global efficiency in these networks, so how, um, how easily and efficiently information moves throughout the network. Right? And so the plot here that I'd like for you to look at is actually plot A. And what we'll see, again, is this nice inverted U-shaped pattern that I kept talking about earlier. What we tend to see is that a network we really care about, this yellow curve, the frontal parietal control network, which is heavily implicated in cognitive control, tends to have the highest level of degree. It's basically densely connected to a bunch of other nodes. Uh, in this balanced difficulty condition, but it's not as densely connected. Basically, it doesn't uh, interact with as many other nodes in the low or high difficulty conditions, right? So it's pretty interesting. We also can look at this global efficiency measure, right? Essentially how efficiently information moves through the network. And the curve you wanna look at here is this orange curve. And what you'll see is basically if we, you know, no matter how we threshold the, our data, basically remember when I was showing on the previous slide, um, how we decide you know, which nodes we recode as zero and which nodes we recode as one. Basically what we can see is no matter how we threshold the data, the balanced difficulty condition actually has the lowest global efficiency score. And so you might be thinking, wow, that's really weird, right? Um, and that is kind of a strange finding. You would think that when you're deploying, trying to deploy cognitive control, you might need the most integrated network, right? And you would need information to travel through that network as efficiently as possible. Well, interestingly enough, there's been a series of studies now that have all kind of had this similar result. And one of the things that these studies kind of tend to show is that when people are deploying cognitive control, especially for practice tasks, things that they've gotten good at, the brain actually figures out a way to optimally wire up the, its uh, functional organization 
in a way that reduces wiring costs. One of the things that we know is um, when the brain is super wired up, has a really high global efficiency uh, value, um, that tends to have a really high metabolic cost associated with it. Whereas when the brain kind of pars away some of these functional connections and has a more optimized global efficiency value, this tends to have a more or a lower metabolic cost associated with it. And so what people have found and what we found as well is actually when people are deploying cognitive control, you tend to have this lower global efficiency, more metabolically efficient brain network organization. So again, what we've discovered here is that these tasks that are observable under high experimental control, doing things like a Stroop task, we can also start to demonstrate and discover in these more um, naturalistic style settings. And so the last question we might have is, okay, well, if the first two results kind of feel like trying to show, um, show a similar finding with a slightly different task or a slightly more naturalistic task, we can start to ask, okay, well, can video games give us some method or way to understand how these brain networks are actually functioning together, right? So I'd mentioned that we were looking at the way different regions of the brain are connected to each other or communicating information with one another. We might ask ourselves, can video games give us information as to how that works? And the answer I think is yes. And so one of the big questions in uh, cognitive neuroscience right now is how is it that uh, information transfer kind of happens over time among different brain regions? And there's two competing ways that this is thought to happen. The first is through this phase coupling process, which is essentially when two or more brain regions are synchronized together. And so if you look at this bottom left figure here, you can kind of see the neural time series for a bunch of different re brain regions. And they all kind of seem to oscillate at the same frequency, right? They're nicely synchronized together. A second uh, hypothesis for how connectivity works, how brain regions transmit information to each other is through what's called this metastability hypothesis. And it's essentially when two or more brain regions shift between being synchronized or highly integrated and unsynchronized or quite segregated in their response patterns. And that's what this middle uh, curve shows you here. What you can see kind of early on is that the different neural time series are all kind of doing their own thing, right? But then you get these moments where they all kind of start to come into phase. They all start to synchronize a little bit and you see this synchrony pattern and then they go out of phase again, right? And so for a variety of reasons, it's actually difficult to tell one way or the other what's happening, at least in the brain, at least when you're using techniques like fMRI. Um, you tend to need fairly long tasks uh, you tend to need tasks that sustain the cognitive process over time. And so one of the nice things about video games is people tend to play them for a while. They tend to have uh, the capacity to sustain these cognitive processes. And so maybe they actually give us a nice technique for answering this question, right? When brain regions are communicating with each other, are they doing it in this phase coupling way? Or are they doing it in this metastable way, right? And so we've looked into this. We actually just... Uh, finished collecting a new study. This was among, among a bunch of different uh, participants. We actually gathered these data uh, when I was at Ohio State University before I came here to UC Davis. And one of the things that we found was the synchrony explanation seems to be working with our data much better than this metastability explanation. So why do I say that? Well, there's a couple of things. One of the things, if you look, these figures are somewhat misleading. We need to make them better. Um, if you look at the vertical axis, vertical axis on these two plots, you can see that they're actually on a pretty different scale. So um, the synchrony plot is on a much larger scale than the metastability plot, actually uh, a scale that's about twice the size as the metastability plot. So one of the things that we see overall is that the magnitude of our synchrony measurements is much higher than the metastability measurements. So that's already a pretty good sign, giving us some indication that uh, you know, the, the, the synchrony result is much stronger than this metastability result, right? The next thing we can look at is we can essentially start to see, okay, well, in our three conditions, you know, our boredom condition or our low difficulty condition, our frustration condition, our high difficulty condition, and this balance condition in the middle, 
how well do the um, how well do can we distinguish between synchrony and metastability between these conditions, right? And one of the things we can see in this plot is that there are observable differences in synchrony between our experimental conditions, but there are pretty much no statistically observable differences, uh, statistically significant observable differences in metastability, right? And so not only is this metastability result much lower in magnitude, but none of it really works statistically, right? Whereas the synchrony result is much higher in magnitude. Statistically, we can differentiate between these experimental conditions. And so what the conclusion we've come to is that synchrony itself does seem to be a better explanation for how brain or how the brain is communicating during cognitive control, right? And so if we're gonna try to wrap up and summarize what it is that we've learned, there's a, a couple kind of take home messages that I'd like for you to uh, keep in mind. So one, we can observe behavioral markers of cognitive control when people play video games. Video games can elicit neural responses associated with cognitive control. These responses are metabolically efficient and uh, they result from a synchronization process, not this metastability process. So we can actually kind of start to gain a little bit of an understanding about how brain regions communicate with one another. And then finally, naturalistic stimuli like video games can help us learn a little bit more about how the brain works. And so to kind of wrap up, I just want to say, uh, doing this sort of work takes uh, an army, it takes a village, and I've been really blessed to have some wonderful collaborators along the way. And one of the things that if any of this sounds interesting to you, uh, probably, yeah, about half of the people on this page are undergrads that have cycled through the lab um, and helped on a variety of these different projects. I'm really excited to get people involved in this research. I love it very much and I think it's a lot of fun. And so if this sounds interesting to you right now, we don't have a lot of openings because nobody's scanning anyone because of COVID, but hopefully um, next year that will be a really different story. So if, if this sounds interesting to you, I really encourage you to reach out to me um, and let's chat a little bit more, okay? And with that, I just wanna say thank you all for coming out tonight and listening to me blab on for a little bit. I've loved the chance to do that. And now I'd love to hear your questions. Very nice, very nice, super interesting. So why don't we uh, we'll just open up? I think we're small enough that we can just, if you want to unmute or if you want to post a, there's a couple, there is a question already in the chat. Um, we could start with that one, and then if others want to uh, unmute and, and uh, rate or raise your hand, we'll, we'll, we'll take all questions as possible. So I noticed uh, Brianna is asking, oh, I'm sorry, Sarah Simpson asks, does this have any implications for game design? Oops, sorry, you're muted again, Richard. God, a year later, I say, <laughs> so you and I are in the same boat. Um, let's see, so let's actually share my screen because somebody asked to see um, contact information as well. So yeah, so does this have any implications for game design? I think so, right? And so there, I'm not the first person to be interested in physiological or neural responses while people are playing video games. Um, Actually, Microsoft with their Xbox has actually done this for quite some time now. One of the things they've actually done is they look to, they'll tend to hook people up to a variety of uh, psychophysiological equipment and look for a markers that signal high levels of arousal um, while participants are playing video games. And what they kind of tend to want to do is fine tune the arousal level. So in the same way that a, um, a uh, novelist might try to, you know, create this crescendo of, you know, arousal and anticipation before, you know, the dramatic close to the book or, you know, a, a screenwriter might try to do with the movie. They're trying to do similar things 
with the video games that they produce, right? And so what they want to do is look to see, can we see, it's hard to ask moment by moment, hey, are you feeling excited right now while you're playing this video game? It like totally ruins the experience, right? So they tend to be looking for slightly more unobtrusive measures as well. And so I, I think this presents potentially another toolkit that people could use for trying to understand how to make video games more enjoyable. One of the reasons I showed you this, um, this reward result here is there's a variety of reasons to believe that when the difficulty of a video game uh, or any sort of task is balanced with your skills, specifically if your skill is really high and the difficulty is also quite high, you're going to experience a high level of enjoyment. And so that's what we see here. I mean, in terms of the, the practical day-to-day -day of getting people to go into an fMRI scanner for video game development, that's probably tricky, right? First, it's really expensive. It costs almost $700 an hour at UC Davis to scan people. Um, it's also really slow, right? It, we can, for every participant we scan, we're probably talking about three to four hours outside of the scanner working with them as well. So it, the at least using fMRI as a technique uh, for video game development, uh, maybe not so sure, but in terms of can this research tell us something about, well, when should, what should video game designers look for? Well, one of the things they should look for is trying to constantly balance the difficulty of the game with the uh, participant's ability, ability at the game. And game designers know this, they actually talk about it a lot. Um, and it's, it's one of the core ideas behind what makes some franchises so successful is they get this balanced difficulty and ability right really uh, well. Yeah, that's a great question. Other questions for uh, Richard? Um, Richard, have you, are you aware of any research that uh, kind of has followed someone through the journey of familiarizing themselves with a game? Because I know that when I play a game, when I first play it, it's often very hard to like distinguish one visual stimulus from another. Mm -hmm. But then like after hour 10, there's like so much stuff that I ignore that I just don't even process. And then, you know, the things that are salient cues are like popping out, right? You know, um, and I'd be really fascinated to know what that trajectory looks like from, you know, everything makes no sense to, I have this world very clearly defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I haven't seen any research that has tried to discover exactly how that, um, uh, that plays out within an individual or when somebody learns a new video game. A lot of the research that does that or tries to address a similar question is looking at comparing frequent gamers versus non-frequent gamers, right? Um, and one of the things that they see is pretty, pretty big differences between the groups in terms of uh, capacity for kind of low uh, low level cognitive tasks. So capacity to, you know, hold a variety of, you know, different game tasks and working memory at once. Uh, you tend to see people are a little bit better at tracking visual objects if they are uh, experienced gamers versus not. And yeah, this makes sense, right? These are kind of mechanics and techniques that video games require from people. So the, the short answer to your question is I haven't seen any research that has looked at how that emerges over time, but at least when you compare people that are, you know, playing video games quite a bit in their everyday lives versus, you know, people that don't play video games at all. Yeah, you do tend to actually see uh, some sharp distinctions in these low level cognitive abilities. Yeah, it's a great question. My um, son has been watching and he actually has a question to ask you. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. You can get on camera. That's okay. uh, do specific types of video games like influence these studies, or does it just like any kind of video game work? That's a that's an excellent question. Um, so we developed um, this little video game because it gave us we could control everything about it, right? So like we could one of the things you want to watch out for 
for the types of studies we tend to do are uh, confounds or alternate explanations that um, change that provide some other way of explaining why you got the sort of result that you got, right? And so in this simple game, we can control all the visual information in the, the game, right? So each condition can have the same number of asteroids. They might just move around a little more quickly, a little less quickly, but at least the visual complexity of the space is the same, right? Um, but we have used some more complicated games. You can see my screen, okay? Um, we have a paper out where we have uh, actually played participant or had participants play a first person shooter video game while they're, they're in, in the fMRI scanner. And so here, what we have done is we've, you know, they're all doing a lot of very different stuff when they're playing, when somebody's playing a first person shooter game. They, sort of the state space of different strategies that somebody might employ during the game is massive, right? And so it, it constrains the way that we can look at the data. But one thing that we've done, and you'll start to see some similarities here is again, you'll see this little red probe in the top uh, left corner of the screen. What we do is participants uh, play the video game. They have to, again, respond to this probe. And what we've done here is we've essentially looked at how, um, how distraction works while participants are playing the video game, right? And so what we can do is we can create this distraction index, which is basically looking at over a sliding window of, I think it's about 10 seconds in this study, how many times did that probe appear? How quickly did they respond to that probe? And then what we can do is we can use that to essentially model changes in neural connectivity between these brain, between brain regions, right? And what we, with the hypothesis we had going into the study was essentially that the brain's attentional network uh, has a, a robust property, essentially where it's robust against distraction up into a certain point, and then it like completely falls apart. So like, if you, the, the analogy, I have a dog. And so like my dog will, you know, bark quietly when he wants my attention and I can ignore him for a while and not be aware of it. But at some point he barks just loud enough or does something that everything collapses and I stop focusing on whatever it is I'm focusing on and focusing on my dog, right? And so what we think is we're trying to see with the study is, okay, does, can we look to see if attention follows the similar pattern, right? So essentially connectivity within brain regions associated with attentional processing should be fairly high when distraction is low up until some critical threshold point and then it's going to collapse, right? And what we found in um, our results is exactly that. So the curve you want to look at in this figure is the red curve. It basically is a curve where our uh, model shows this kind of concave pattern of connectivity results between brain regions. And so what we see is for a variety of brain uh, regions, they tend to be fairly robust to distraction as they communicate information between each other, but at some point it all tends to collapse and uh, the communication gets disrupted. And so, yeah, it's a kind of a long way of answering your question, but I, I think it's fun to show some data with it. Yeah, we have done more complicated games. It just gets, it kind of constrains the types of questions that you uh, can, you know, can answer with them. But yeah, these are these are fun approaches to doing that. And we're not the only ones that uh, have done this. There's this really cool um, taxi driver study um, where uh, the researchers got uh, participants that were just normal uh, Londoners to come into the lab and play a taxi driving video game. And then they got actual taxi drivers from London to come in and play this video game while they were getting their brain scanned. And they compared the results of people that were sort of expert at spatial navigation skills versus non-spatial navigation experts and did actually find some uh, interesting uh, differences as well. So yeah, there's, depending on the question, there are some really creative ways that you can use different types of video games to answer it. You've got a question in chat too. Oh, whoops, sorry, more tangible question. Um, were there any video games in particular that made me wanna start pursuing studying video games? Oh boy. Um, hmm.
so back when I had lots of, so the, it, it's kind of funny because there's, there's a definite yes to that question. And then I took a, like a, a really sharp shift away from it. So um, back before grad school, I had all this free time and I played World of Warcraft a lot. I was a giant nerd. Um, and I thought it was super interesting and I was really interested in how people developed social relationships uh, in these big multiplayer online games. I, I noticed that it was a, a big component of the game and draw of itself. And so when I was starting grad school, I actually thought that that was going to be the question that I was particularly interested in, where the how people develop social relationships in online communities and platforms. And then I started you know, taking more cognitive science classes and learning a little bit more about the brain, got really fascinated by that and completely stopped caring about what people are doing online socially. So um, maybe that also had something to do with the collapse of like my robust social network uh, due to the demands of grad school and all that. Um, but it, that's kind of the, the funny story, but I think it also underlines a broader point, which is, it's, it's really one of the fun things about pursuing this type of research is it takes you in all these interesting and unexpected directions. And if you're comfortable and okay and willing to take a risk and try something new, you might find something even more interesting and exciting than what you originally thought. And I've definitely had the, the excellent fortune to experience that myself, yeah. see animal crossing has gotten you through switch for the last year i have not played animal crossing i it's like the one pandemic thing i haven't done like i've tried everything else i swear to god but i animal crossing has been the one thing that i've i've, I've stayed strong against excellent other questions um I have another one. Yeah, sure. uh, Richard, do you have any um, future research that you're excited to do maybe when you have access to a scanner again? Yeah. Um, so future research that we are thinking about doing, one of, the, one of the things that I've been hoping to get a little bit more involved in, uh, a good colleague of mine is interested in you, the extent to which video games have intervention potential, especially for people who uh, say um, have ADHD. And he's been trying to organize a series of studies where they, where we'd essentially examine exactly that. And so that's something I've been hoping to try to do um, moving forward, but. I've kind of had to put a lot of that on the back burner right now just because of um, because, because of COVID times, but it's something that we've been looking forward to, yeah. And that looks like, Leo, you have your hand raised? Yeah, hi. Hey. Um, um, I guess my question um, is what these findings are these, about what you'd expect for people doing any task with divided attention, or do you think it's unique to this kind of environment? Yeah, that's a really games? that's a really good question. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, that's that's a really good question, um, and it's something that we're pretty worried about ourselves, and so. It, part of the reason we we do the the three experimental conditions, the the low difficulty condition, the high difficulty condition, and the balanced difficulty condition, is it is a way for us to at least in part rule that out, right? Um, it's a way for us to um, it's a way for us to say, can we observe like does the brain look the same? Uh, across all these three conditions, or can we actually see differences, right? So is the brain actually uh, deploying different strategies um, or that, that's really bad to say out loud. I don't mean it that way. Uh, can we see evidence that the, the brain is essentially responding to these 
different tasks in slightly different ways, right? And we do in fact see that. And one of the, the cool findings is the, the results we have are consistent across studies in our lab. And there's been a couple other labs that have tried some similar style studies and found similar results. But then, excuse me, uh, there are a few other labs that have, um, have looked at this, like I was telling you about the taxi driver in, in London study, they actually see a pretty different pattern of neural results. There's been people that have um, brought participants into the lab and uh, had them play violent video games and has seen fairly different patterns of results there. So like, I would say that in the same way as we can get different types of behavioral and neural results with um, you know, simple lab-based experimental procedures, we seem to uh, be able to do it as well, just with these more complicated uh, <clears throat> uh, tasks. Yeah, it's a, but it is something that we definitely ask ourselves and worry about quite a bit, because that would be like terrible if we were just fooling ourselves. Um, so does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. I was just wondering about like, divided attention things we do like all the time versus this experiment. Oh yeah, so how this speaks broadly to the divided attention literature, I, I'd have a, I'd have a hard time responding to that too closely um, without feeling like I was saying something that stretched beyond what the results might be able to speak to. I, I, I know that's not like a really satisfying answer, but I would hate to say something that I wasn't so sure about. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Great, great questions. Uh, super interesting. If, if I might ask a question, Richard, yeah. I, was, I was intrigued by the, the difference between the metastability um, and was the other condition uh, synchrony, right? Yeah, exactly. I'll yeah. In, in the metastability, um, do you have to define some like temporal window mm -hmm. um, for that to occur in. And, and, and what, 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 how do you make that decision, what that window should be? Yeah, so that's a good question. So the way that we do this with the, um, the metastability and phase coupling analysis is we're looking at the neural responses actually not in the time domain. Um, so whereas these, these data here are all just correlating the neural time series with each other and looking at everything in the time domain. For this series of analyses, we're actually looking at uh, the neural data and the frequency domain. Okay. And so um, we essentially transform the neural time series data into frequency data. And then what we can do is we can calculate the um, uh, phase coupling and metastability of uh, of the neural data. And so when we're doing that, we're actually looking at it across the entire task uh -huh, okay. rather than within a window. We have done some windowed stuff um, with time series data and I can kind of talk to that, but at least for these results, we're looking at it in uh, frequency. I understand, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other, other questions for Richard? There's a question in the chat from Sarah. Oh, perfect. Do I still play video games? And if so, <laughs> what are my favorites? Oh gosh, I don't play a lot of video games anymore, which is like some, sometimes a big uh, regret I have, but here and there, I will find the chance to sneak in Civilization. I enjoy Civ, the Civ series a lot. I've been playing it since I was um, you know, uh, younger and I, I like that a lot. So I'll still play Civ here and there, but. No, my, my game uh, life right now is pretty boring. I think the, the last game I played on my phone was like Plants vs. Zombies, and that probably should date 
should date my should date me a little bit. So. It's one of those things where as soon as you start to do too much of it and work, it stops being fun in your personal life a little bit. You know, like I think about, you know, games enough in my own in the lab every day. I want to think about something different when I get home. Binge tick sea sea shanties on TikTok or something like that. So yo ho ho. So maybe on <laughs> on 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 that note, I think I'd like to would Let's thank our speaker today, Richard, for giving us a really interesting uh, talk and very thought provoking. And once again, thank you all to our wonderful cognitive science students. You are what make this program so dynamic and so uh, popular. Uh, and uh, it just said a, 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 we're a, a real becoming a real force on campus. So it's, it's to your credit that uh, we have such a recognition. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending today uh, and give one last hand to uh, Richard. And, and thank you uh, advising staff and program committee for uh, being here as well. So um, we hope to we hope to be in touch uh, soon and maybe we'll try another one of these uh, next quarter towards the end of the quarter or something uh, before everybody, those people graduate. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, and, and please uh, reach out if you uh, are interested in this type of research. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was lovely to see you all. And thanks to Dave for hosting. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Cheers.